Whenever things got rough, I always remember what my father used to say. Running a business does test a man, my son. There are ups and downs. Glorious eyes. And sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated. The character of a man and the character of a business are not very different, are they? Yes. But when the chips are down, we must stand up. Dust ourselves off and motor on. Volatility. It's a funny thing. It makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions. Sure, you can question some of your decisions, but stay steadfast on your goals. Dad always said, there are no shortcuts and no quick profits. There are no free lunches, are there? There is only one right way. At PPFAS, we think like Rahul and his father. That volatility is a fact of running a business. And buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business. We use value investing principles to manage your money. This means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and for a longer term. PPFAS Mutual Fund. There's only one right way. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. Uh, on a semi-final evening, uh, we had some nervous moments uh, last week. Initially, we thought uh, if India were to be uh, at number two, we would be playing the semis today. So we thought uh, only me and Ronak, two of us, will be here. But as things turned out, uh, we have a good presence today here and uh, hearty welcome to people in uh, Bangalore and Delhi as well, people who are joining us remotely. Our next session will be on uh, 20th of August, 2-0 August and in September it's on 19th, 1-9. So uh, let's dive right into today's uh, topic and presentation. Uh, it's relevant for people who took a ride on one of the ride sharing apps. How many people came by Uber or Ola? This, okay, around 20% of the people here. So before we start, how many people think it's a bubble? And uh, try and be at least in yes or no. So, uh, how many people think it's a bubble? One, two, three, four, five, six. How many people think it's not? Plenty of people. Would you buy the stock? Is it looking good? Okay. Uh, so, we'll discuss this and... Uh, uh, unlike most presentations where we try to keep it interactive as we are presenting, today I will try and take questions after the presentation. Uh, reason being that the service is so common and we are so familiar with the service that everyone has a view. And the last time I presented I ran off, out of time because uh, there were so many points of view that uh, we couldn't just progress to the next slide. And there was a lot of crosstalk, so one group of people arguing with the other group as to uh, why their point of view is correct. So we'll do that, but we'll do that at the end, once we are through with the slides today. So Uber has its fair share of controversy. Uh, this guy is the earlier CEO, uh, Travis Kalanick. Uh, so there were all sorts of controversies. Uh, his motto was, ask for forgiveness, not permission. So, actually Uber launched in most places and it was an illegal service. It's just that, uh, so most countries, most cities have taxi licensing norms and stuff like that. Here, he just launched an app, signed on drivers and 
uh, started offering a service it became popular and then uh, people tried to figure out how to uh, bring it in the legal fold and again various controversies in terms of the corporate culture doing opposition research on journalists and trying to malign them and various various things so they have had a lot of bad press and for some time there was this delete uber campaign running on social media so this is one reason why people think it's a very frothy company and not a serious company worth investing in and again the general spirit of the times is such that uh, it is almost reminding us of the late 90s or the dot com era there is this wonderful article on this portal the ken uh, about softbank and oyo and which is representative of the kind of things that are happening in the marketplace so uh, those of you who have subscribed i would urge you to read the article it's quite uh, interesting in terms of what's happening in the technology and the startup space so definitely there are plenty of bubbles floating around uh, today anyone with a business plan and with a app development team uh, raises a lot of money and round 2 is at a higher valuation round 3 is at an even higher valuation and so on so definitely there is a lot of froth we will look at whether it applies to uber or not so what we'll do is we'll uh, take the advice that charlie munger has given us he says that to argue against something you should know the counter parties arguments better than they know so you should have full information before forming an opinion in other words many a times people form opinions on uh, half baked in baked information so people may have seen one sound bite here or uh, some journalist may have written a small article and people get influenced and people paint everything with the same brush so all technology companies are frothy or something like that so before evaluating whether it's a bubble or not we will first gather data we'll try not form opinion but rather be in the data gathering mode so anyone here has read the prospectus of uber or lift no one right so i guess most people have not read the prospectus so of course it's not so relevant for us in india because uh, it's not listed in the indian markets but even in the us or even uh, a lot of people opining about uh, these companies don't really know uh, what is there in the business so don't try to read this there's just one uh, line which is highlighted in yellow in the prospectus they said that we have lost money in the recent past and looking at the current trends we may lose money for some time right now based on this one line in the prospectus the media went crazy it's a company that will never make money firstly that thing never make money is not written there and again it's a legal speak uh, typically all these prospectuses are drafted by lawyers uh, all statements have to be carefully weighed and you want to be sure that you will not be subject to any lawsuits down the road uh, so they will make all sorts of conservative statements in the prospectus and the media latched on to this saying it's a company that will never earn any profit and how can this be valued at billions and billions of dollars so it's complete bubble a complete scam and two of these companies got re uh, listed recently so as on date the market cap of uber is 74 billion dollars and lift is around 18 billion dollars so again a billion dollars is 6900 crores so 
multiply that by 74 it's a pretty pretty large company and again the thought comes why should a company which has probably just developed a app be valued at maybe more than some of our bluest of blue chip companies which have been around for decades uh, what is so special about some people sitting in a room and writing a mobile app so whether one is investing in these kind of companies or not uh, if one is curious about why some of these companies do what they do it's interesting to read this book called uh, blitzscaling and it's not just written by someone who has no knowledge it's written by uh, people who have been uh, in the startup uh, phase and it has a forward by bill gates so it makes interesting reading as to how some of these startups have gone about creating valuable businesses and why in the initial years or in the initial phase it makes sense to go after scale rather than worry too much about efficiency efficiency can be worked on later in the initial stages one should work only on scale and this does not apply to all sorts of companies it applies only to a specific category of companies what is that category we'll look at it today so before even diving into the topic in detail i'll just play a small video clip it will give a context to uh, what some of these new age businesses are or what is this entire app economy about so this is a clip from uh, this person uh, some of you may have seen him uh, his name is hasan minaj and uh, he has this show on netflix uh, so i'll just play a small clip i i i'm way more lazy than i am woke okay i'll just admit it we've all been in these compromising positions before right look i deleted uber i was like uber you're done and then i landed in vancouver and i was like damn it they don't have lyft <laughs> convenience is the commodity that matters most to our generation i can't believe i used to physically go to stores take money out of my pocket and pay for stuff like a peasant <laughs> with amazon i just do this mm and things come to me like i'm an emperor and it's not just me we all love living like king joffrey essentially whether it's ride hailing in terms of uber ola lyft all these companies or amazon flipkart or your swiggy or whatever task rabbit or basically time is a precious commodity and people want convenience people want things to come to them rather than having to go to uh, fulfill your needs and services so what does what problem does a company like a uber or a ola solve and people who just say that it's a taxi company in another name i don't think i've thought through some of the uh, problems that get solved and these problems we never realized were there till the time they got solved so just imagine that these are different lanes in the locality where i stay now i am standing here on a rainy monday morning wanting to go to the airport with my luggage the taxi driver is in the next lane now taxi driver does not know i am here i don't know the taxi driver is there now should i go to that lane to search for a taxi should i go there there or there i have no idea right so we will keep hunting for he'll keep hunting for passengers i'll keep hunting for cab drivers so first problem that a company like this solves is it matches the service provider 
to someone who requires a service. With ratings, where at the end of each trip, the passenger will give a rating to the driver and the driver will give a rating to the passenger, this trust economy builds in. So, over a period of time, if a driver consistently gets one rating and uh, bad comments from customers, that driver will be kicked off from the platform. And if a passenger is consistently rude to drivers or does not turn up on time or does not make payments, that passenger will be kicked off from the system. So, another factor that it solves is trust. Now, some of the issues may still arise even in such a environment, but the entire database of the driver is there. So, even if someone commits a crime, it's easier to catch someone who's on the platform rather than someone driving a individual cab. The other problem that typically arises is refusal to go where you want to go. So, let's say someone is standing at Bandra, wants to go to Nariman point and the taxi driver is, it's late evening, the taxi driver has decided that he wants to go home and he is winding up his shift. Now, you will ask the taxi driver, take me to Nariman point, taxi driver will refuse. He says, I am close to my end of my day and I only want to go to western suburbs. Now, on a platform, all these problems can be solved. So, typically on a platform, you will not have so many rejections. The friction of at the end of the trip, hunting for change, like you have a 500 rupee note and let us say the trip cost is 350. If you do not have change, you have to struggle, uh, ask people passing by or some shopkeepers for change. Which route to take? Now, app based by default by the design, they will have updated traffic information, updated route information, tolls, everything and they will optimize for time. Again, so optimize by time is one and sometimes the driver may not know the route. So, this is uh, especially helpful. So, let us say we travel a lot for work, we are familiar with Mumbai roads. If we want to go somewhere, we can tell the driver how to go about it and which route to take. But let us say we are in Chennai, sometimes language may be a barrier. We may not speak Tamil and uh, driver may not speak Hindi or English. But on an app, if you have put the destination, the driver knows where you want to go and there is no confusion. Again, typically in the black and yellow days, you had one premier Padmini which was available for everyone. Now, sometimes if you are going alone, you may want a small car. If you are going to the airport with your whole family, you may want a SUV. So, uh, the size and the cost, you can optimize for that. Drivers would not know what is the peak time to drive. So, typically if they would start in the morning like any office goer and end up at night. Whereas now, because of the surge pricing and I will come to surge pricing separately, but because of this different patterns which can be analyzed and which can be communicated well, drivers know exactly which are the hours when they should be on the roads and when there will be soft demand where they can probably just relax at home instead of uh, being on the streets trying to find a fare. Also because of dynamic pricing, given that fares in off-peak hours are low, people who are not in a hurry can take those off-peak times to uh, do their journey or to commute. Whereas office goers or students will need to be there at a specific time, they will be peak hour customers. So, it manages both demand as well as supply by price mechanisms.
again if each individual taxi driver were to buy a car that person has to take the price what the manufacturer will give them over a period of time as these aggregators gain power they have the possibility of doing bulk deals with uh, car manufacturers with insurance companies with uh, service providers the mechanics and all that with insurance providers again typically share a taxi only works on specified routes so let's say if you are going from church gate to nariman point there is a stand but otherwise sharing a ride is difficult in the non app based economy if you are a single person going from point a to point b and it's a long distance it would be more economical if you were to share the ride so that possibility only happens when you are in the app based uh, economy again a lot of people have this flexible employment opportunity so they may have one part time job they can do this on the side to get some additional income again we'll come to driverless in a bit but uh, that possibility is there where if autonomous vehicles pick up then you could have these fleet of autonomous vehicles on the road and they can take you wherever you want and a lot of auto manufacturers and financiers are thinking actually overall car ownership may come down uh, not just because of these factors but we'll look at some of the other factors where people increasingly choose to avail of uh, ride hailing and ride sharing instead of buying a vehicle for themselves so you would have received this whatsapp forward uh, people in mumbai where if you park your car in a no parking zone towing charges are 10000 rupees now for instance and those challenges have already started being issued to people now 10000 could be equivalent to your monthly commute budget now if you just park your car once and it gets towed once in a month your entire month's expenditure is gone so obviously parking charges fines all of these are a big factor going forward uh, in this choice of whether to take a ride sharing ride hailing or whether to buy your own car so the questions that are there and which need to be answered before we decide whether uber and the like are frothy companies or are they attractive opportunities are these is there a double sided network effect we'll also look at what a double sided network means but this question needs to be answered is there a winner takes all business or will there be too many players will there be 20 ride hailing companies or will there be only one or two in each city third question to be answered is is the lifetime value of a customer very high and are there ancillary benefits which the company or the service provider can get sometime in the future those are not being achieved right now but those would be future benefits so these four questions are essentially the questions which are to be answered to decide whether you should go to the blitz scaling model or whether you should go the route of the normal business that we typically know a normal business will be figure out what your cost of service is price at cost plus basis earn profit each year grow uh, uh, grow on a gradual basis blitz scaling is go all out and try and grab market share try and become the number one don't worry about costs right now don't worry about the fact that you are making losses right now so these are two completely different ways of approaching business and which approach to follow 
can be decided only once you have answered these four questions. So if it's a winner take all business and if, or if there is a double sided network effect, if the lifetime value of a customer is very very high, if there are future ancillary benefits, then you should actually seek greater losses. You should actually seek to gain market share even at the cost of burning a lot of cash in the initial years. Does not make logical sense, so it took a while for me to absorb what point was being made in the book, but somewhere down the road I understood what they were trying to say. Now this may seem like it's a new age thing, it may seem like Oh, all these business models have come only after internet came in, only after mobile phones came in. But that is not true. Double sided network effects have been around for decades and ages. And people like Buffett and all have spoken about it, although in a different context, different terminology. So we will look at how that works. So let us look at stock exchanges for example. Old timers may remember that each city in India had a stock exchange. So you had a Calcutta stock exchange, you had a Delhi stock exchange, you had a Kanpur stock exchange. Each city was its own local market. However, once electronic trading came in and once NSC, BSE came about, all those exchanges had to shut shop. Why is that the case? See, let us say if tomorrow I set up a new stock exchange, I may have the best technology and I may offer the best of commercial terms. But if all the buyers and sellers are on NSC, who will come to my exchange? Someone who wants to transact, if that person puts an order on my exchange, that person will not get a counterparty. So any stock exchange which, which has momentum going for itself, it's very difficult to dislodge them. Think about this. At one point, there were two different speculative mechanisms in the stock exchange. NSE has had futures and options as we know them today. BSE had something called Vyaj Badla. This was in the earlier days, uh, 90s. Both were doing well. There were some unscrupulous practices in Vyaj Badla, so that was banned by SEBI. Now after that, BSE tried to enter the futures and options space. They have been trying since then. For decades they have not been able to break into the f and segment. NSE once it got leadership, it was very difficult to dislodge. Think about MCX as a exchange for let us say gold trading for example. The promoter company got into this mess with this NSCL scam. For a while there was uncertainty whether the exchange would survive or not or what would happen. NSC which is a market leader in equities and which has a very strong balance sheet has been trying to enter that space. Now even BSE is trying to enter that space. But once MCX got leadership in that segment, it became very difficult to dislodge MCX from the uh, gold trading for example leadership. Look at credit card companies, Mastercard, Visa. If merchants accept Mastercard, Visa, Customers will take MasterCard Visa credit cards. If customers have MasterCard Visa credit cards and debit cards, merchants will start accepting that. And that loop will become stronger and stronger. Now, if we at PPFS were to launch a PPFS debit card, who will sign up for that debit card if no merchants are accepting it? And merchants will not sign up because there are no existing customers. So again that becomes a double sided network effect. At one end you have merchants, at the other end you have customers. 
so what does a double sided network mean there are two different players two different category of players and the network matches both of them in stock exchanges there are buyers and sellers and they have to be matched in again in debit and credit cards there's a seller or the merchant and there's a buyer or the customer look at things like linkedin linkedin you have employers and you have the general category of people who put their profile so that's a double sided network facebook and whatsapp are not double sided networks so there's a those have network effects but those are not double sided because all the participants are more or less similar but even a non double sided network has network effect so let's say if i develop my own app which is much more secure than whatsapp but who will download that app from the play store because all our friends all our family members everyone is on whatsapp so if we download a new app we'll be all alone in that space there will be no one with whom we can communicate now facebook is a much smaller company than alphabet or google google has been trying to break into that social networking for a long long time they tried with orkut google plus uh, circles and what not uh, at least 5 10 attempts they would have made to break the stranglehold of facebook on social networking but they were unsuccessful because facebook had those network effects once you have a critical mass it becomes very difficult to be dislodged and buffett has actually spoken in great detail about this effect he calls it survival of the fattest so he has spoken about this in the context of newspapers i'll just keep the slide on for a minute you can just read what's there you can put up the slide so what he says is no paper in a one paper city however bad the product or however inept the management could avoid gushing profits newspapers were the primary source of information for the american public whether the subject was sports finance or politics newspapers reigned supreme just as important their ads were the easiest way to find job opportunities or to learn the price of groceries at your town's supermarket he continues the great majority of families therefore felt the need for a paper every day but understandably most didn't wish to pay for two every family wanted one newspaper but they did not want two newspapers advertisers preferred the paper with the most circulation and readers tended to want the papers with the most ads and news pages this circularity led to a law of the newspaper jungle survival of the fattest thus when two or more papers existed in a major city which was almost universally the case a century ago the one that pulled ahead usually emerged as the stand alone winner so buffett has not used the word double sided network but it effectively means the same thing instead of a high tech platform there's a there are dead trees and news ink printed papers at one side there are advertisers at the other side there are readers more advertisers means more news content they have more money to pay journalists and develop more content more ads more content means more readers more readers means more advertisers more content more readers it goes into a virtuous cycle for a new entrant 
नो एडवर्टाइजर्स नो रीडर्स इनकर लॉसेज टू डेवलप कंटेंट बट स्टिल योर कंटेंट विल बी लेसर देन दी मार्केट लीडर सो यू विल बी इन अ विशियस साइकिल एंड यू विल बी आउट ऑफ बिजनेस सो दिस इज वॉट वी मीन बाय डबल साइडेड नेटवर्क इफेक्ट इन सच अनेरियो वेर विनर टेक्स ऑल वेर देर आर टू साइड्स एंड वेर देर दिस वर्चुअल साइकिल इट मेक्स अ लॉट ऑफ बिजनेस सेंस इनकरिंग लॉसेस इन दी अर्ली पीरियड एंड ट्राई एंड गेन डॉमिनेंस ट्राई एंड बिकम द नंबर वन प्लेयर इन दैट फील्ड एंड इन दैट मार्केट सो वील जस्ट लुक एट सम random numbers and again uh, before we go ahead i'll make this statement we don't own uber so uh, neither do we own in personal capacity or in for the fund or uh, in any which ways and we don't plan to buy it any time soon so it's right now just at a observation stage but there are some very very interesting numbers which are there pertaining to this business so we'll just look at these numbers and try and get some context out of it in a completely unrelated business area apple inc which makes iphones and ipads and all got 46.6 billion dollars in a year from its app store for the purchases of apps and games and uh, subscriptions that people did this amount spent by people globally by swiping their debit cards and credit cards in a year is more than dollar 20 trillion this is the annual number right so these are some random numbers and we'll try and get some context out of it so look at the market cap of visa visa is having a market cap today of 392 billion dollars it's at 37 times price to earnings and these are the revenue and profit numbers mastercard is at 278 billion dollar market cap however i would argue that uber and lyft and ola are not like visa or mastercard visa and mastercard are just people who run computer networks they run networks which connect the swiping machine the card terminal where you swipe your card at the merchants end to the servers of the bank the bank account of the merchant is with what is called the acquiring bank so let's say access bank is the banker to the petrol pump where you are buying fuel so when you swipe the card at the petrol pump the card will send a signal to access bank access bank will send a signal to mastercard or visa visa will send a signal to let's say hdfc bank who has issued your card and hdfc bank will approve the transaction within a second or whatever time it takes now in one or two days whenever whatever is the defined time period hdfc bank will make the payment to access bank for that petrol pump they'll deduct a small charge and that fee will largely be shared between access bank and hdfc bank mastercard or visa will get only a very tiny sum from this whole transaction they will not make much money from this transaction Uber, Ola, Lyft, all these companies, I think, are more like American Express. American Express does things end to end. They are the banker, they are the issuing bank, they are the acquiring bank, and they are also the network. So they do all these uh, activities. So American Express, although is much smaller than Mastercard or Visa. it's still valued at 106 billion dollars card spend on their network in a year was slightly more than a trillion dollars 
revenue which is the fees plus card issuing fees interest and the discount on swipes was 40 billion and their net profit was about 7 billion so these are some of the double sided network businesses that we have seen so in other spheres it's a large business it's not that these are minuscule businesses and they can be very very profitable it's not that they are necessarily loss making businesses so now let's uh, look at some numbers pertaining to the transportation industry and pertaining to uber just look at the way the number of trips taken on the platform have grown so in 2012 this company was not there so or somewhere thereabouts it started so in about uh, 6 to 7 years from 2012 to 2015 they managed only 1 billion trips total on their platform then in less than a year they doubled to 2 billion and now they are at 10 billion trips in a short span of time so one learning from the graph is it's a company which is growing very very rapidly so how much is the size of the opportunity that they have uh, just a trivia quiz uh, any guesses on the total value of the cars and trucks sold worldwide in a year? Any guesses? Random number? 200 billion? Okay, more than that, uh, significantly more than that. 10 trillion is on the higher side, but it's around 3 trillion. Okay, so despite growing so rapidly, Uber accounts for less than 1% of the overall miles driven worldwide. Now, not everything will be addressable. Some of them may be in rural areas or less dense areas and all of that. But still, it's a very small fraction of the overall potential market. So they are also into food delivery and all logistics. There, there is a negligible market. Uh, in the countries that they operate, uh, only about 2% of the people have signed up and they use the service on a monthly basis. So 98% of the people don't use their service in a month. 3 trillion is the capital value of cars and trucks sold in a year uh, this does not include various other things uh, this does not include fuel cost insurance uh, servicing all of that what companies like uber and ola and lyft do is from a business to consumer product where a maruti sold to an end consumer it could become a business to business product where a maruti sells to a ola or to a uber as a group of course individual drivers will own their personal vehicle but the negotiation could somewhere down the road happen at the group level for the model and the features and for the pricing and they could also do self insurance or they could uh, negotiate bulk deals for let's say spare parts or tires or maintenance and things like that so whichever number you take they say the size of the uh, opportunity is more than 5 trillion dollars and all of that but essentially it's a huge market just like we saw American Express or just like we saw MasterCard and Visa where the opportunity is huge even here it's a double sided network market and personal transportation is a huge market again what sometimes we miss out on is that with 
the availability sometimes the demand may also go up in a scenario where each person has to either drive themselves or uh, figure out where to park and things like that if this service is available a lot of people start using it uh, handicapped people people uh, of uh, advanced age small children people who would otherwise not be able to commute uh, have this opportunity once uh, at the press of a button if a vehicle is available to you so from the prospectors right now they have about 9 crore people who use their service every month they are present in more than 700 cities across the globe every day 1.8 crore trips in a month sorry in a quarter 150 crore trips they handle on the platform they have close to 40 lakh drivers on the platform and people paid them 41 billion dollars in a in 2018 and this has grown from 18.8 billion so just to put that in context in 2 years they have doubled their overall booking done on the platform so gross bookings is the amount that the passenger pays on the platform of course a lot of it has to go to the driver so after paying the driver they are left with 9 billion this was in 2018 so again 9 billion as compared to 40 billion so 41 billion so roughly it is said they have a 20% cut so sometimes it's more sometimes it's less typically that's the number that drivers speak about or media speaks about so again don't try to read it's a number heavy slide i'll just read out some of the key numbers in a quarter so in the march ending quarter they made revenue which is their share not the uh, after paying the driver their share was about 3 billion dollars and they made a loss of 1 billion dollars so why are they making losses and why despite the losses it is not clear that it's a fraud maybe it's a bad business model maybe it's not but we look at the reasons behind the losses active users as we said around 9.3 crore people so they have something called core platform contribution so again i don't know whether one should take this at face value or one should go with the 1 billion loss per quarter but in their estimate the loss would be 180 million dollars remaining would be uh, something which is not so much of a permanent thing and some of those are investments for the future so whether you take the reported gap numbers or whether you take the pro forma numbers given by the company that's a separate debate but we look at the reasons why they make losses right now and why they will continue for a while and probably that's a good thing to a uh, diagram which makes a lot of sense so just think about a city where uber does not have a presence right now what is the first thing that they require in a new city the first thing that they require in a new city is first they have to sign up drivers and when they sign up drivers they have to assure the drivers of some income even if they are no passengers so initially when they enter a city they go on a driver signing spree they say just log in to your app and be ready to drive even if you are just sitting in the car we'll pay you some money 
just come on to our platform so that's a big item of loss so that's this first point that is there you need to have cars once you have cars passengers will have less wait time and they will start using your service once you have passengers you have more drivers because existing drivers will tell their friends saying this is a good activity why don't you also sign up so more drivers will come in and when more drivers come again you will have more passengers and that virtuous cycle will kick off and once that virtuous cycle is on a roll that is the time when they start to roll back a few incentives if you are familiar with what happened in our city initially people made incomes of as much as 50000 a month 60000 a month 70000 a month the initial drivers who signed up with uber and that was a hook to get all these people onto the platform and once people have come on the platform now they are saying you will get what the customer pays minus our share take it or leave it kind of thing now they don't need to create that initial flywheel effect and this will continue city after city however if they were to go from 700 cities to let's say 800 cities the 100 new cities where they enter they will have to give high incentives to drivers to come on to that platform because otherwise this virtuous circle will never start so what how does this work so of the 50 billion that the customer pays them 80% goes to the driver roughly balance is left with them of the balance they pay for operations and support general and administrative research and development and marketing that is the item of expenditure now what is happening is that the spend on marketing is required at the initial stages and we have already seen that uh, only about 2% of the people have signed up to the platform so lot of more people are actually yet to come on the platform so if you are tracking the world cup cricket world cup you would have seen dhoni uh, talking about uber and they are running this campaign where you spend a lot of money on the platform then you get a chance to uh, meet dhoni and things like that so why do they spend so much money you don't see your neighborhood black and yellow taxi driver advertising on national tel television even these guys will not need to advertise down the road times of india does not advertise on a regular basis once the cycle is up and running once they have achieved critical mass they will be able to cut back on marketing spend and they will be able to cut back on driver incentives those are at elevated levels right now because they want to increase market share and it's a winner takes all market so mind you in china they were not the number one they were far behind and they were continuously losing money so given that it's a winner takes all market they did a smart thing they exited china and they sold their business to the leading player in china and they have taken a stake in that company in the middle east there's a app operator karim c a r e e m karim so they have taken that taken over that company in southeast asia uh, in countries like malaysia singapore and all there's a operator called grab earlier they were competing head to head with grab but they realized it's no point in both of us burning money they have ceased operations in uh, southeast asia and now they have a stake in grab they were stake in yandex so wherever they feel that they will win and wherever they will be number 1 they continue fighting fiercely wherever they are laggards they are exiting the market and taking stake in those uh, places
so again just as illustration let's say customer pays 10 dollars they would pay driver about 8 and they would be left with 2 currently where they are paying incentives they would be making a loss of 1 dollar so essentially from this column to this column transition happens as and when they achieve a certain amount of scale we have seen this happening in a city like mumbai whereas in india itself some of the tier 2 tier 3 cities they would still be in the loss making phase in mumbai they might be making profits for example similarly they are also competing in the food delivery space by their brand uber eats so all of these are separate businesses however one interesting point which came from the prospectus was that uber eats has some synergies with uber the ride hailing company so what they mentioned somewhere was that the peak commute hours are in the morning and in the evening in the afternoon is a slack period for the drivers and uh, in a city like Mumbai, I think both are different ecosystems. Typically, uh, all these uh, wagon hours are used for uh, Uber, Ola, and the food delivery happens on a motorcycle. But in some cities in developed countries, the car can be used for food delivery as well. And the same driver can do different kind of activity during afternoon lunch time or things like that. So, a lot of meal ordering happens around lunch. So, uh, this was one way of utilizing extra capacity in non p cars they are also trying something in freight etc but uh, i haven't taken as much of a deep dive into these aspects so so far i have said all exciting things about uber but it's not a sure thing so after listening to this presentation it does not make it is not automatic that you go out and buy the share. There are plenty of risks around. So, firstly, 20% uh, share is hurting a lot of people. A lot of people are protesting that. And if uh, by legislation, if a national monopoly is created or if let us say government of Maharashtra comes out with an app saying this app will be used in the entire Maharashtra state all uh, private taxi operators have to log on to this app and we'll take only a 1% service fee then maybe uber could be forced out of business or something like that or if the taxi union creates its own app for example the other thing is if autonomous vehicles come in then it moves from a double sided network to a single sided network mind you right now there are drivers and there are passengers. If driverless cars come in, then drivers are out of the equation. Then it becomes more like a car rental company. Uh, Hertz, Avis, Avis, Budget, all of these car rental companies. Then any car manufacturer can dump 10, 20,000 cars in the city and say, we are in ride hailing business. Download our app and we are cheaper than the other guy. So then, it could disrupt the business model of uh, Uber and Lyft. So, these people are aware of this threat. So, some of them are investing directly into their own self-driving efforts. So, Uber is one of them. So, one of the reasons why they make losses is they are spending a lot of R&D money on autonomy. Some people, so incidentally, Alphabet owns stakes in these companies. Uh, Lyft has recently partnered with Waymo in Phoenix. So now autonomous vehicles can be hailed by the Lyft app. So uh, apart from these risks, there are a lot of litigations which are also happening. And uh, yeah, the in some places, again, one other risk is if Uber and Lyft both keep raising money and keep burning money, trying to be number one, then this battle could continue for a long, long time. So, how soon it will end, we do not know. 
it could possibly turn out to be like our telecom wars in the worst case where everyone wants to kill everybody else so yeah that was the talk for today uh, happy to take questions uh, we'll start with uh, participants here and then we'll switch to the uh, delhi and bangalore participants yeah rajiv uh, where does it actually end where, where do you come to the point where you can say now where we're going to be profitable and everything's good personally i would think that uh, the leadership battles in most markets are over uh, so i mentioned china where there's one player southeast asia where there's one large player uh, in us uh, uber is i think 5x that of lift so already lift is a distant second so logically uber in a winner takes all market uber should continue gaining strength and lift would be at risk we'll see how that pans out in some markets there are two players head to head so uh, in india for example ola and uber are fighting it out again ola is also expanding to some foreign countries so ola is also trying to compete in some other markets essentially the end game will be where uh, all these venture capital guys and the likes of softbank run out of cash and say okay now let's focus on profit enough of uh, market share battles and once the city roll out completes so let's say if there are they i don't know what is their ultimate aim for number of cities but let's say if they their ultimate aim is for 1500 cities for example then once they complete roll out in 1500 cities then that would be the end of it each time you enter a new geography it's a given you will have to burn cash the business cannot start without burning cash so uh, once the geographical roll out is complete that's when the so rajiv uh, sir competitor yeah so we have seen those uh, exits happening already in lot of markets so lot of markets it's become a winner take all and that's the nature of thing so let's say in mumbai at one point in time you would have had times of india indian express free press journal uh, various newspapers finally it was just times of india so uh, again i gave the example of stock exchanges you had ns you had bsc calcutta stock exchange delhi stock exchange kanpur all of these gradually it became one dominant exchange which is nse and bsc is also there kind of thing. so in a double sided network business uh it's usually winner takes all but i take your point there's no certainty if there was certainty i would have said it makes an attractive buy but given that some of these uncertainties are still there we have to watch correct yeah so in grocery i am not so sure whether it's a winner take all grocery there may be multiple players uh that, that's a different conversation altogether uh, e-commerce and grocery uh but this is more like the newspaper business or the stock exchange business where you have to so again like i said uh rainy monday morning i am waiting for a cab a cab is waiting for a passenger cab is in the next street if there are multiple platforms it's as bad as the existing scenario if i am on uber waiting for a cab 
and if the cab driver is on ola waiting for a passenger we will never meet efficiency demands that number of platforms reduce right now we have two let's say there were 20 platforms then i would have to open 20 apps to see where the cab is or the cab operator would be simultaneously on 20 apps finding a passenger so it never works well when there are numerous apps the industry economics are such that consolidation has to happen yes any other questions very surprising uh, The market is matured, like in China, where uh, ride hailing is quite matured in India. How has auto industry performed over the last five years out there? And any indications by auto companies there they are seeing a slowdown due to that? Any they have written in their reports or something? Yeah, recently sales have been soft uh, for auto. Uh, now attribution is always difficult. How much of slowdown is because people did not buy a second car because of ride hailing one does not know in fact some demand could come because all these people are uh, or, or all these platforms are creating demands for uh, new cars so somewhere i would think shift would happen from cell phone cars to uh, people who drive cars as a profession uh and somewhere it will impact overall sales but how much of it is due to this factor we don't know even india auto sales have been somewhat soft now how much of it is due to uber ola very difficult to estimate uh china india china of course much higher penetration than us but a market like us where the number of cars would be close to maybe 80 90% of the overall population that's a very very saturated market and there the sales can drop very very dramatically in india where the penetration is very low some people in fact argue that with ride hailing coming in people who never dreamt that they could go in a car would occasionally use a uber or ola let's say someone who cannot afford a car but he has to attend a family wedding now on that one occasion he'll say okay today my family is there they won nice clothes uh, people have won uh, jewelry let me today go in a air conditioned uh, cab so some additional demand could get created let's say if children were not going to music classes or dance classes or uh, tennis lessons now that you have these apps you can track them on a real time basis you have the details of the driver and all of that some people may feel comfortable uh, sending their children or elderly parents to some of these functions so some additional demand could get created so uh, how the whole uh, thing plays out remains to be seen big impact in developed countries where it's a very saturated auto market in emerging markets like india there will be both sides there will be some people who will give up on the second car or drive less because of parking bores and all and some additional people will come to the market uh, for maruti what is the break up of uh, their sales to these uh, these apps these are the normal passenger okay. raj you have 9 to 10 percent is what raj says again uh, there's certain element of lumpiness so if two or three fresh city rollouts happen suddenly there will be a demand and of late at least in the larger metros mumbai delhi and all some older drivers gave up because they were lured in by the monthly 50 60000 incomes and they bought cars on emi and it was a bait and switch obviously then the incentives came down and some of them said it's not worthwhile anymore so then uh, there was a slow down in fresh car sales so there is a certain element of lumpiness to the 
uh, sales. Uh, what's your personal view on when they will start <coughs> making money? I would think in four to five years. Within five years, I would expect profitability to come to the sector. Unless uh, autonomous picks up in that period. So autonomous is a big uh, question mark. Autonomous legislation, all these are big question marks. Uh, on a as is basis, I would think within four to five years, all these uh, rollouts and price wars would be over and uh, clear leaders would emerge and the leaders would be the winner take all. Thank you. Do we have uh, numbers on, you know, what is the breakup of their cash burn on Uber Eats and uh, yeah. There is some detail. I, I haven't, so since uh, we are not evaluating it as a investment opportunity, I haven't done that much of a granular work, but maybe it would be there somewhere in the prospect. Uh, Raju, I just wanted to know, you know, some of these companies besides Uber, uh, they, these companies provide convenience to an day. Don't you think this uh, is a transition happening in terms of where the convenience is catering to a particular need of a vast mass? These companies will have a higher uh, multiple in days ahead, going ahead because governments have tried to clamp them down. They're trying to a lot of cities in London, in France, they have a lot of rebellion against services like this. So what's your opinion about in terms of A, I think the model has survived, B, uh, in terms of convenience, you think like the black cabs, their days are numbered or you think there is a shift happening in that side? So in Mumbai also we have seen these protests uh, where uh, taxi unions said they should be banned and all that but customers have taken to it and that's why government is trying to balance uh, the consumer interest as well. See, that's why we saw all the pain points that they solved. So it's not that if you ban them those pain points will be solved by the existing black and yellow cabs. Uh, the problem of the driver finding the uh, customer, the change at the end of the ride, uh, driver wanting to end the uh, shift, customer wanting to go elsewhere, all those pains. So uh, ride sharing not possible because of uh, not knowing who is going in which direction. So all those pain points are being solved by the apps and the technology. Now, rolling back, I don't think would be possible given that people have tasted the convenience. There would be a customer backlash. So I think uh, regulation will be there. So for example, the uh, unfortunate incident in Delhi, the uh, rape that happened in Delhi. Now after that panic buttons were legislated. So for some time, they had to go off the roads, uh, they had to do higher background check on the driver. They have to install those panic buttons. Uh, now they have the uh, share the right details and location tracking and all of that. So periodically you could have these one step back kind of situation to address a particular uh, concern. Then this question of whether all the Uber drivers, whether they are contractors or employees, uh, should they be allowed tips, not allowed tips. So all these uh, issues somewhere down the road will get uh, thrashed out. Uh, some legislative actions will be there. Society will demand some uh, regulation or some safeguards. But I don't think they will go away as a concept that suddenly we'll turn back time and we'll go back to a era where uh, none of these guys existed. And second question is, uh, companies like Uber and you know, they're funded by some of the wealthy like SoftBank and the Saudis. 
uh, when the clock starts tick, uh, ticking back on SoftBank and the Sovagen funds, don't they, they have a lot of pressure in terms of stock-wise? Because they will need to exit at some point. So even in the Uber and Lyft IPO, a lot of the early investors sold stock in the IPO itself. And once you have given the money to the company, it's the company's money. You can't get that money back. Worst thing you can do is, you can dump the stock. And if fresh funding ceases for these companies, actually the path to profitability becomes quicker. So if neither Uber nor Lyft had money to burn, then they would automatically cut back on marketing expenses. The big, first hit will be taken by Virat Kohli. He'll not get the uh, brand ambassadorship for Uber. Then the next hit will be by the incentives uh, drawn by the drivers. Great. Should we take the remote questions? There is one question from Delhi which says, which is the last book that you have read and what would you recommend? Uh, yeah, one book, interesting book is Blitzscaling, which I referred to uh, in the presentation. But the last book I read was Bottle of Lies. It's on a unrelated topic. It's on the uh, scandals which are or the business practices in the uh, generic pharma industry, especially Indian companies. So it's a bit scary book uh, in terms of uh, how the uh, priority is given to company profitability rather than patient health. So. Uh, that was quite interesting. The next question is from Bangalore. Uh, what is your assessment of the management quality and are there any questions on corporate governance in the company, in Uber specifically? Uh, corporate governance was terrible in the uh, reign of the earlier CEO, uh, Travis Kalanik. So he was thrown out of the company and a new CEO has been brought in and uh, as of now, it, uh, a lot of improvement has happened and overall it's a much better run company now. The next question again is from Bangalore. What is the potential of Uber Air? Mm, too difficult. I haven't thought about it. So, uh, logically, if someone can figure a way out, then it would ease a lot of congestion uh, over a period of time. But... Uh, yeah, too nascent right now. Uh, what are the kind of valuations that you are looking at when you look at such companies? Valuations have to be uh, like any other business. So it's not that if you are in a glamorous business, you get a higher multiple versus uh, a non-glamorous business. It's just that some of these businesses where uh, it's a double-sided network effect and like Buffett says, survival of the fattest. Uh, sometimes the longevity of the business may be long. So that's why they may get a slightly better valuation. But otherwise, it would be valued like any other company. What is the price you are paying in terms of market cap? And as against that price, what profits do you expect to get? And uh, one next question is from Delhi. How do you see the business of auto companies shaping up in the next three to five years with all these dis disruptions coming up? Uh, there will be a lot of change. So uh, actually we have done a uh, maybe one one hour talk twice on the auto sector itself. So we have spoken about uh, specifically the electrification, how uh, introduction of electric cars will affect the auto industry. Uh, today's talk was on the ride hailing and ride sharing uh, aspect. So I think uh, all these factors are coming in. Uh, electrification, uh, ride hailing, ride sharing, autonomy and changed business model. So uh, as I mentioned in the previous presentation, uh, Mary Barra, who is the uh, CEO of uh, General Motors, she said that uh, in the coming five years, we'll see more change than we have seen in the last 50 years. Yeah, probably that was the last question. Uh, just one question which has just come in. 
so uh, roads these times are uh, you know chock a block with traffic so uh, if that uh, infrastructure improves substantially and the metro development happens which uh, you know uh, lessens the travel time so what is the is it a potential risk to the uber and olas of the world so uh, suburban and metro uh, rail systems are already present in developed countries and are coming at a rapid clip in uh, a country like india so every city that you visit you are seeing uh, metro rail work in progress whether it uh, be mumbai whether it be uh, hyderabad uh, bangalore uh, chennai pune so metro rail systems will be there what will happen is there will be a hub and spoke kind of uh, model where the long haul could probably be uh, done on the metro rail network and from uh, the end points to and fro uh, the last leg could be on these uh, ride hailing companies also some people uh, for convenience sake or for prestige or for sheer uh, lack of ability to use public transport maybe ill health or maybe uh, some disability or uh, very young age very advanced age may still use uh, ride hailing services so it's not that suddenly we'll have empty streets both will coexist yeah that was the last question thank you so much thank you everyone Whenever things got rough, I always remember what my father used to say. Running a business does test a man, my son. There are ups and downs. Glorious highs, and sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated. The character of a man and the character of a business are not very different, are they? Yes. But when the chips are down, we must stand up dust ourselves off and more wrong volatility it's a funny thing it makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions sure you can question some of your decisions but stay steadfast on your goals dad always said there are no shortcuts and no quick profits There are no free lunches, are there? There is only one right way. At PPFS, we think like Rahul and his father. That volatility is a fact of running a business, and buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business. We use value investing principles to manage your money. This means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and. for a longer term ppfas mutual fund there's only one right way mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully